The Equality and Human Rights Commission. Despite its noble title, which gives the impression it's dedicated to equality and human rights, the reality of how it's operated since it was established almost 13 years ago tells a very different story. Let's start from the beginning. The Commission came into existence through the Equality Act 2006, replacing several different bodies to become the chief enforcer of equality and non-discrimination laws in Great Britain. But only two years after it was established, six members of its ruling body resigned, calling into question the leadership of Trevor Phillips, the chair of the Commission at the time. Concerns had been raised about comments Phillips had made regarding race and about his alleged closeness to the new Labour government. He questioned the concept of institutional racism, criticised multiculturalism for supposedly sleepwalking Britain into segregation with fully-fledged ghettos and seemed to be providing a cover of respectability to a litany of racist and prejudiced ideas. But it wasn't just his comments that caused concern. Trevor Phillips was close to a number of high-profile figures in the new Labour government, including Peter Mandelson, who was best man at his wedding. In fact, their relationship was so strong that when a revolt began over his leadership, it was reported that Peter Mandelson and Harriet Harman hatched a plan to give Phillips a seat in the House of Lords and a ministerial position in a botched attempt to manage the controversy. But the problems didn't end with Trevor Phillips. The Commission is a quango and by its very design lacks independence. Senior figures at the Commission owe their position to the government, which also pays their handsome salaries. Meanwhile, hard-working junior staff are starved of the resources to properly investigate discrimination. And the Commission also seems to be plagued by institutional racism. In 2017, it was accused of targeting black, Muslim and disabled staff for compulsory redundancies. And just recently, it was reported that two former members of its ruling body, who were the only black and Muslim commissioners at the time, said they'd lost their positions at the Commission in 2012 because they were considered too loud and vocal about issues of race. Over the last few years, we've seen how the Commission's lack of independence has led to its purpose being perverted in order to attack the British left, Jeremy Corbyn and his supporters. The warning signs came as early as September 2017, when the Commission's Chief Executive, Rebecca Hilsenroth, said, anti-Semitism is racism and the Labour Party needs to do more to establish that it's not a racist party. No major political party has ever been singled out by the Commission in this way. Even the Tories haven't faced such scrutiny, despite being responsible for some of the most egregious racism exhibited in public life today, targeting Muslims and black people in particular. The number of alleged cases of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party are minuscule and were clearly exaggerated as part of a pernicious smear campaign against Corbyn and his supporters. But that didn't stop the Commission from targeting the party. Of course, it just so happened that Labour had inflicted a huge blow to the Tories at the 2017 general election, and fears about a potential Corbyn premiership had sent shockwaves through the establishment. It should be remembered that for the vast majority of its existence, the Commission's operated under a Tory government and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future a fact that seems to influence its decision-making processes. For example, in February 2018, Young Labour, which is the party's youth movement, proposed a one-day national equalities conference open to women, BAME, LGBT+, and disabled people. The conference was to elect some of Young Labour's equalities officers. But almost as soon as the conference was proposed, the Commission swooped in to shut it down, following an outpouring of faux outrage from Tory politicians saying that it could constitute unlawful discrimination. It seemed that a pattern of behaviour was beginning to emerge in how the Commission interpreted its legal powers, singling out and undermining the official opposition on behalf of the Conservative Party. This reached fever pitch in May 2019, when the Commission opened an investigation to determine whether the Labour Party had unlawfully discriminated against, harassed or victimised people because they're Jewish. The investigation was launched following lobbying efforts by a couple of anti-Corbyn pro-Israel outfits the self-styled Jewish Labour movement, and the so-called Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, or the CAA. The latter organisation has been funded by the Anglo-Jewish Association, a pro-Israel charity. Rebecca Hilsenroth's husband was deputy president of that charity when a £5,000 donation was made to the CAA in 2016. But contrary to the Commission's rules, this clear conflict of interest wasn't disclosed. The CAA first complained to the Commission about the Labour Party in July 2018, 
and Helsenroth had oversight of the Commission's response until she eventually recused herself six months later. Furthermore, the Commission singularly refused to take any action against the Conservative Party over Islamophobia. This is despite repeated calls on the Commission by the Muslim Council of Britain to open an investigation into widely documented allegations of Islamophobic and racist behaviour by Tory members, including the current Tory leader. Instead, they've determined, surprise surprise, that the Tories are capable of investigating themselves. Yet we're supposed to believe the Commission's independent and impartial. Even Rebecca Hilsenroth has sounded the alarm bells about the Commission's lack of independence. It was revealed on Newsnight late last year that Hilsenroth had sent a letter to the head of the civil service with concerns about the current chair of the Commission, David Isaac. Now this is what she wrote. David regularly declines to take public positions. Recent examples include the publication of a piece of research into the implications of losing access to EU structural funds and the stripping of Shemena uh, Begum's citizenship. The implication, it would seem, is that Isaac's refusal to take positions on issues that might embarrass the government shows his reluctance to challenge this Tory regime. It should be remembered that Isaac comes from a big city law firm, Pinsent Masons, where he continues to work as an equity partner and is paid up to £620,000 a year on top of his commission salary, which is dwarfed by comparison. And Pinsent Masons benefit from a number of lucrative government contracts. Although I understand Isaac is no longer involved in those contracts, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that there's still a conflict of interest. He's also written for the Conservative think tank Bright Blue, which has been provided with support by the Commission on his watch. The think tank also published an attack piece on Corbyn and anti-Semitism written by Stephen Pollard, the editor of the pro-Israel Jewish Chronicle. Isaac's work with Bright Blue appears to fit into a pattern of Commission bosses working hand in glove with the Conservative think tanks. Indeed, Trevor Phillips is a senior fellow at the Islamophobic pro-Israel think tank Policy Exchange. Given its record, it's pretty clear the Commission lacks independence, is institutionally racist and has been abusing its legal mandate by attacking the official opposition. In my view, the Commission's conduct played a leading role in derailing Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and in legitimising a McCarthyite smear campaign that only gets more menacing by the day. Far from being an equalities watchdog, the EHRC has become a right-wing attack dog. We'd all do well to remember that.